for some of the things that we have learned in the last two lectures. And I'll begin with a couple of really interesting examples which illustrate the application of thermodynamics. And then I'll go on to discuss equilibrium and phase diagrams. In the last lecture, we came up with an expression for the entropy of mixing, the change in the entropy of mixing, when we mix small n A atoms with capital N minus N B atoms on a lattice which has N sides. And we worked out the number of ways in which we can arrange the A and B atoms on those sides as N factorial over N factorial into N minus N factorial. And we take the logarithm of the number of arrangements because entropy is an additive function. So if I take two bodies with different entropies and put them together, then basically uh, the total entropy is still the sum of the individual entropies. Uh, we use a mathematical approximation to work out these very large numbers and their logarithms. Uh, and that led to this equation here which was further simplified by expressing the concentration of A atoms as the mole fraction of A and similarly for the B atoms. So the final change in entropy when we start with the pure components and we mix them up um, is given by this simple equation 1 minus x log 1 minus x plus x log x into minus k and the Avogadro's number. This is a plot of the change in the entropy of mixing as a function of the concentration of A atoms. And you can see that it achieves a maximum when the concentrations of A and B atoms are equal. If we also assume that the enthalpy of mixing is zero, then the free energy of mixing is simply minus the temperature times the change in the entropy of mixing and that will obviously go through a minimum when the concentrations of A and B are equal. Now, so far we have only looked at a binary system uh, and we need to generalize the expression for the entropy of mixing to a multi-component system where we may have more than just two components. Here is our entropy of mixing for a binary solution and generalizing is very easy. We simply write the entropy of change in the entropy of mixing as the sum of all these terms where I is the concentration of whatever element we have added into the mixture. Supposing uh, we look at the ternary system, again you can see that the entropy of mixing is actually at a maximum when the concentrations of A, B and C are equal. But more than that, you know, supposing we have a two component system, then the maximum entropy of mixing is 5.74 joules per Kelvin per mole. If you have three components, it's greater, it's 9.15 joules per K per mole. And for five components, it's 13.4 joules per K per mole. Now, if I make my multi-component alloys out of many different elements, then I will achieve a large entropy of mixing. And that is the goal of a particular procedure that we use for the design of materials, where we want the material to be stable as a single phase, even though we are adding large concentrations of various elements. This is an illustration of a very special battery that is used to power spacecraft that go far away from Earth. Uh, small spacecraft traveling, you know, to the borders of the solar system. This region here is hot because it has plutonium that is decaying radioactively. And adjacent to it is a material known as a thermoelectric material. If you establish a temperature gradient across that thermoelectric material, then the ions inside want to carry the heat from the hot part to the cold part, and therefore you develop a potential difference. In other words, you, generate, uh, you can generate electricity. 
So one uh, parameter that you need for a thermoelectric material is of course uh, a large amount of electricity per degree of uh, temperature gradient and that is expressed as a Seebeck coefficient which is delta V if V is the voltage uh, divided by delta T where delta T is the difference in temperature and the performance of the battery varies with the square of the Seebeck coefficient. The second criterion is that it must have a very low thermal conductivity otherwise you don't maintain a gradient across the material. So I'm now going to illustrate how uh, we can use the concepts of the configurational entropy of mixing to design a single phase material which has really good Seebeck coefficient and thermal conductivity. So here I'm plotting the Seebeck coefficient. You can see it's uh, microvolts per Kelvin uh, versus thermal conductivity. And we really want to be in this regime where we have a large Seebeck coefficient because I explained to you that the performance of the thermoelectric battery depends on the square of the Seebeck coefficient and then it's divided by the thermal conductivity because we want to maintain a large temperature gradient across the thermoelectric material. <coughs> now, Haishu Yan decided that it would be interesting to make a ceramic based on a high entropy concept. Uh, so I explained to you earlier that if we mix equal amounts of ingredients, then we maximize the entropy. So here you have zinc, tin, titanium and hafnium mixed in equal amounts on this particular sub-lattice of this oxide. And that enabled him to obtain a single phase material. Okay, And you can see that it has a very high Seebeck coefficient. Normally, you know, uh, the Seebeck coefficient is of the order of 200 and it has a low thermal conductivity. And the diagram I've shown here is a greatly simplified uh, um, version of the one that he published because it shows much more detail. But the point is that a very simple concept of maximizing the entropy produces a single phase oxide with optimum properties. Also, mixing up all these atoms uh, reduces the thermal conductivity because the vibrations are not as uh, lattice uh, atomic vibrations are not as correlated as they would be in a single element material. So going back to our equation for the entropy of mixing, um, if I differentiate this equation with respect to concentration, then I get log 1 minus x into log of x, which at x equals 0 or 1 has slopes of plus or minus infinity. So drawing a free energy curve like this is wrong because the slope here should be infinite. Okay, So this is the correct way of drawing free energy curves as a function of concentration if these are the pure substances at the two ends of the horizontal axis. Now there's one more thing that this kind of uh, a curve illustrates is that there is a very very sharp um, slope here even though the intercept is finite. And that means it's very difficult to purify materials because you would have to put in a, a lot of work in order to get rid of the last bits of impurities. So in general it's too expensive to make things too pure and therefore when we design materials for use we make them tolerant to the presence of impurities. Uh, so far we have written the free energy of mixing as simply minus T delta SM, uh, which is the configurational entropy of mixing, uh, and we end up with uh, quite a simple expression. But we are ignoring many things. For example, entropy itself has many components. Uh, you know, the electrons themselves are particles and they will contribute to entropy. Uh, whether or not the magnetic spins are aligned and also vibrations of the atoms on the lattice. So there are contributions to entropy other than configurational entropy. And similarly, 
you know, when we break AA bonds and BB bonds to form AB bonds, there will be a contribution to the enthalpy of mixing. And we generalize, therefore, the free energy of mixing as not just the contribution from configurational entropy, but also from the enthalpy terms and entropy terms that are not expressed in the configurational entropy of mixing. So this would be a quantity which includes, for example, bond changes when you mix atoms and thermal vibrations, etc. So this is the equation that you would normally use to express the free energy of mixing. These quantities have to be uh, obtained experimentally or calculated using uh, various methods. Now I come to the first example where we are going to use what we have learned so far to express uh, a really interesting uh, real problem uh, which we face in industry, for example. And th so this is an application of thermodynamics. Now, we have so far considered the mixing of atoms, but there are many industrial processes where we mix powders rather than atoms. And of course, each powder particle consists of many, many atoms. And the reason for doing this is that we mix powders, we put them into a ball mill uh, where these uh, cast iron balls impact against the powder and force the different powders together because that may be the only way in which we can cause these powders to mix. Uh, if we try to melt them together they will create separate phases, you know, a bit like oil and water. So this is a process in which we force atoms to dissolve into each other by mechanical force, okay, uh, caused by the impact of these uh, iron particles, or iron um, balls on the raw powder that we feed into this ball mill. So with this we can create strange alloys where powders really don't want to mix. If we try to melt them they would phase separate, but we force them to do so and form a solution on an atomic scale. And the reason for doing this is that we want uh, properties that cannot otherwise be achieved. So this is a process known as mechanical alloying. Of course, we end up with an alloy powder. What we really want is a solid chunk of material. So you take your powder and you extrude it hot through a die. So th this is illustrated over here, for example. And that compacts all the powder and produces a solid object which you can use to do uh, many things. So this is rather like you know the children's toy where you extrude plasticine out of a, a die. But this is done at uh, high temperatures because metal powders etc will flow at high temperatures and bond together at high temperatures. So this is a commercial process. So we started off with the supposition that instead of atoms we want to mix particles of A and B together, each containing very many atoms. Can we work out a configurational entropy of mixing given that these are powders, in other words large clusters of atoms, rather than individual atoms? Uh, when dealing with atoms, uh, we came up with this as the total number of arrangements of um, small n a atoms in a total number n of all atoms. Now, supposing that each, par each uh, particle of a con contains m a a atoms and m b b atoms in each particle of b, then we simply modify this equation uh, by dividing the number of A atoms by the particle size and similarly the number of B atoms divided by the particle size of B. And this is the total number then of particles factorial analogous to this and similarly this is analogous to this and this term to this except that we have now greatly reduced the number of arrangements because we've divided by the number of atoms per particle. And, you know, if you have a random mixture of particle, then we simply take the logarithm of this to find the configurational entropy of mixing of powders. Now, 
without going into details, and you don't need to worry about this, if I uh, take the logarithm and multiply by k, I get the entropy of mixing of particles uh, like this. And if you set the particle size to just one atom, this will reduce to the normal equation we have for the configurational entropy of mixing. Using the entropy of mixing that we derived in the previous slide, uh, we can work out the free energy of mixing uh, simply by multiplying by minus t and the free energy of mixing as a function of the number of atom atoms per particle. And you can see that the free energy of mixing becomes larger as the particle size decreases. And this is because when the particles are very large, they don't really feel each other's presence because it's only the atoms at the interface that come in contact with other particles. And that represents a very small fraction of atoms. So when the particles are very large, they behave more like a mechanical mixture than a solution. Now, supposing we argue that 10 joules per mole is a sufficient free energy of mixing for us to think that the particles are beginning to feel each other's presence, then that would be at a particle size of approximately a thousand atoms. Okay, so when you get to particles which are smaller than a thousand atoms, we will get a larger contribution to the free energy of mixing. And that's obvious from this particular plot. Now, it would be nice to be able to verify that when we actually get the mixing of the particles, uh, we are forming a solid solution. And to do that, we need to be able to observe the atoms in our mixture and to characterize them chemically. So we need both atomic resolution from a spatial point of view and also atom by atom chemical analysis. How can we do this? Well, we can actually look at the atoms inside our material, atom by atom, using an instrument known as a field iron microscope, where you know we produce images like these, where each dot represents an atom. But in addition, you can make the atom fly and measure the time of flight uh, between two fixed points, and that tells us exactly what kind of atom it is. So this instrument is capable of both spatially resolving individual atoms and also chemically characterizing them. So this graph uh, shows an atom by atom mixture of iron and chromium which have been forced into each other by mechanical alloying uh, using the ball milling process that I described earlier. So the question I'm asking is does this represent a random mixture of iron and chromium atoms? And, you know, at first sight, that does not seem reasonable given that there are these large variations in the atomic percent of iron or atomic percent of chromium. But we need to think more carefully because when we are analyzing very small numbers of atoms, you could get 100% iron or 100% chromium. And here I'm plotting 50 iron clusters to iron that effect out a little bit. Okay. So we need to compare the distribution of iron and chromium atoms from what we expect in 50 atom clusters in a random distribution of atoms. So here I'm plotting uh, the binomial distribution that I expect from a random mixture of atoms. Okay? And these darker, um, darker bars represent the actual distribution that I obtained in this case for iron atoms, in this case for chromium atoms, and for aluminum atoms. And you can see that there is very good agreement between the experimentally measured distribution of concentrations and what I would expect from a completely random mixture of iron and, at iron and other atoms. So the conclusion is that by mechanical alloying, we have actually produced an atomic solution in which the atoms are distributed at random. Now, another way of looking at the same data is to find the probability, for example, of getting an A atom which has a neighboring A atom.
and the probability of finding an A atom is simply its concentration Xa and the probability of finding another A atom next to it will be the product of Xa times Xa and similarly for the B atoms to find another B atom adjacent to that. For AB we have to multiply by 2 because we can also get BA. So these are the chances of finding these neighboring atoms. And we do those calculations and these are the calculated probabilities of finding chromium atoms, uh, for example next to chromium atoms and you can see that there is pretty good agreement here between a randomly calculated probability and an actual measured probability. So we can truly conclude that the solution we obtain by mechanical alloying is actually a random mixture of atoms. So this is a nice neat application of simple thermodynamic theory which actually has consequences on the mechanical properties of a material that we produced. Now this is a second application of simple thermodynamics and in order to uh, explain I need to actually sh show you that uh, stress of one pascal is the same as one newton per meter squared so if I multiply top and bottom by meters then that's newton meters per meter cubed and newton meters is just joules so one pascal of stress is equivalent to one joule per meter cubed. Uh, bearing in mind that a pascal is a unit of stress but it's equivalent to the energy per unit volume, energy per unit volume here. Okay. So what we are going to do is work out the size, uh, the thickness of a martensite plate uh, by balancing the chemical free energy change accompanying the displacive transformation from the parent to the product phase against the strain energy produced. So we are going to balance delta G versus strain uh, to discover the thickness that we expect for these plates of martensite that form by a displacive transformation mechanism. Now a displacive transformation mechanism uh, will produce a shape deformation like this, okay, and no, no loss of near neighbors there. The atomic uh, arrangement here, uh, near neighbors, are exactly identical as in the parent phase. Now this is a very disciplined movement of atoms, okay? And a disciplined movement of atoms cannot cross crystals because there will be a different crystallographic orientation in an adjacent parent grain. Therefore, these transformation products are trapped inside individual grains of the parent crystal. Uh, you can see they're all stopping at the grain boundaries. And supposing that we define the grain size of our parent phase as L bar, a mean linear intercept L bar, uh, we will use that to define the expected length of the martensite plate because the martensite plates cannot grow across grain boundaries. So here is a real image showing how the plates of martensite do not cross the boundaries between adjacent parent crystals. So they are halted at these boundaries because a disciplined movement of atoms cannot be transmitted across a grain which is in a different crystal orientation. Now just to remind you how we calculated the strain energy associated with the formation of a transformation product by displacive transformation, uh, we took the analogy of uh, simply stressing a material within the Hooke's law region, that means elastic below the elastic limit, and tau here is a shear stress and gamma is a shear strain, then the area under the curve is the energy per unit volume when I apply a stress up to this level. Okay? And if I now replace uh, the tau by the shear modulus times the shear strain, then I end up with the energy per unit volume as half times the shear modulus times the shear strain squared. And I gave you this equation for the strain energy associated with a plate that forms by a displacive transformation. Uh, 
and again look we have a shear modulus and we have the squares of the strains caused by the phase transformation itself but we have this additional term uh, which we haven't derived which is the thickness over the length of the plate so the strain energy will be greater if the plate is thicker so uh, we've already stated that plates cannot grow across grain boundaries therefore we'll take the length of the plate to be equal to the grain size of the parent structure uh, 100 micrometers uh, and set the martensite plate length as equal to the grain size uh, and we can use our equation now to calculate the strain energy per unit volume if we know the thickness and of course we don't know that thickness of the martensite plate well uh, there's a certain free energy change accompanying the transformation a reduction in free energy and we are going to balance the magnitude of that reduction against the strain energy per unit volume and from that we can isolate the thickness here as the driving force delta g times the length of the plate over the shear modulus and the strains squared so if we know the value of delta g we can calculate the thickness of the plate so now suppose the reduction in free energy when the parent transforms to the product is one joule per mole uh, I've got to convert this into joules per meter cube because we are measuring length in terms of meters rather than uh, moles so I need a volume per mole and typically it's about this much uh, so many meters cube per mole of atoms and therefore I can convert delta G into joules per meter cube simply by dividing this one by 7 times 10 to the minus 6 so this is the number of joules per meter cubed of driving force now typically the free energy change that's available on transformation is about a thousand joules per mole so that's equivalent to 1.4 times 10 to the power of 8 joules per meter cubed so going back to our equation for the thickness of the margin side plate if I substitute those numbers uh, here we're taking R as the grain size of the parent material and values for the shear modulus etc then I get my plate thickness as 2.6 micrometers all right so if the plate length is a hundred micrometers then this is the maximum thickness that I can get if I use up all of the free energy that's available for transformation so using this method you've actually worked out details of the microstructure to be expected okay if you want the plates to be fatter then you have to increase the driving force for transformation delta G and if you want them to be even thinner then you've got to decrease delta G by altering the transformation temperature for example those were two examples that I gave you on utilizing the knowledge that you already have in order to treat some problems on phase transformations or making alloys by mechanical alloying for example now I'm going to move on to the equilibrium state okay and equilibrium is you know you keep on observing the system and you don't see any macroscopic change at all no matter how long you observe so for example this ball which is lying in a valley or this one in a smaller valley if I give the ball an infinitesimal perturbation it will simply return to its original state okay it doesn't mean that it can't hop over to an a lower energy state but equilibrium in this sense the mechanical equilibrium is if I give it an infinitesimal perturbation it will go back to its original state now for a transformation uh, in for example a pure substance where there is absolutely no change in chemical composition uh, and in a graph of free energy versus temperature say this is the parent phase and this is the product phase then the transition temperature where the two phases are precisely in equilibrium is simply given by the crossover of the free energy curves so this is the only temperature at which the two phases would be in equilibrium with each other if you go down here it will change uh, change to alpha uh, 
in this region it will remain as gamma, but this is the only point where the two phases can exist together. So, uh, an example of equilibrium in a pure substance uh, is the phase diagram for pure iron, where we are plotting temperature here against pressure, and these are domains where only alpha is stable. So in all of these pressure temperature combinations, we only find alpha. Uh, at higher pressures, we obtain epsilon ion, and at higher temperatures, gamma, and still higher temperatures, delta, and then liquid. The important point is that along each of these phase boundaries, there are two phases in equilibrium having exactly the same free energy. So gamma and epsilon have exactly the fr same free energy for all these combinations of temperature and pressure. And similarly, alpha and gamma have exactly the, the same free energy along the locus of all these points. There is even a point here where all three phases, alpha, gamma, and epsilon, are stable at a particular temperature and pressure. They are in equilibrium. They have exactly the same free energies. Now, this particular phase diagram is interesting uh, in the sense that uh, we can access what's at the core of our Earth by looking at the combination and pressure that we uh, combination of temperature and pressure that we expect there to decide which kind of ion is present at the core. And the answer is that we get uh, epsilon ion, which is a high pressure form of uh, ion. Uh, and uh, there's also, of course, high temperature at the core of the Earth. So we have a solid chunk of epsilon ion, probably, at the center of the Earth. And there are some experiments involving longitudinal and uh, transverse sound waves going through the Earth, which indicate that that is probably correct. Uh, now, as the pressure decreases, we end up with liquid iron and then with the oxides which form the uh, solid crust of the Earth. Now, if you look at exoplanets, which are even bigger than Earth, then we have to go to much higher pressures, and interesting things happen, uh, which we know only by calculation. Okay, there are no, there's no experimental evidence, but at the core of the exoplanets, which are ten times bigger than the Earth, we don't expect epsilon iron, but another form of iron. Okay, so this is how we deal with equilibrium for a pure substance. But most real materials contain more than one element. So how do we define equilibrium in the case of, for example, a binary alloy containing A and B atoms? So I'm going to explain now uh, the meaning of chemical potential. Okay because we will need that in order to consider equilibrium uh, between two different phases of two different compositions. So imagine that we have um, a phase and its free energy varies uh, like so, uh, with pure A here and pure B here. And we're looking at a mixture of A and B of a particular composition X here, which gives us a free energy for that solution G of X. Now, if I draw a tangent to the point uh, representing the composition X, then it intercepts the pure, subs uh, pure axes uh, here, for example, pure B at mu B. And in the case of the axis representing A at mu A. And we'll call these the chemical potentials of A and B in a solution of a particular composition X. I can represent this free energy of mixing uh, at a composition X in terms of a combination of mu A and mu B as follows. Okay, So you can see just from the geometry here that G of X is equal to the chemical potential of A multiplied by the concentration of A plus the chemical potential of B multiplied by the concentration of B. So we have simply weighted these terms by the concentrations and that gives us G.
Okay, that's uh, simple geometry here. Now, the important observation is that we have partitioned the total free energy into a component due to A atoms and a component due to B atoms. So you can think of chemical potential as representing the free energy of the A atoms in a solution of a particular composition and similarly for B. So we have partitioned the total free energy into components due to purely A and B. Okay? So those that is the meaning of chemical potential. Now, supposing that we have two phases, alpha and gamma, and these are the free energy curves representing alpha and gamma as a function of, let's say, iron and carbon. If we draw a tangent that is common to both of those phases, then you can see that the chemical potential of carbon in gamma is exactly the same as the chemical potential of carbon in alpha. And similarly, over here, the chemical potential of iron in gamma is the same as the chemical potential of iron in alpha. That means that the free energy of the iron atoms in alpha and gamma is identical, and similarly for the carbon atoms. Even though the equilibrium compositions which are given by the contact of this common tangent with this free energy curves, even though their compositions are quite different. So uh, the concentration of carbon in gamma, which is in contact with alpha, is actually different from the equilibrium concentration of alpha, which is in contact with gamma. So these two phases have a different chemical composition, and yet the free energies of the solutes in your phases are equal. That means there is no tendency at all, no driving force, no free energy change for these two phases to homogenize. Even though they have a different chemical composition, the free energies of carbon and iron are identical in the two phases. The chemical potentials are identical in the two phases. Now that explains the slide that I showed you in my first lecture of uh, the Antarctica where we had uh, chunks of ice floating in liquid water and the ice is almost pure water whereas the liquid contains a lot of salt and yet they are in equilibrium. That means there's no tendency for the salt concentration to homogenize. And that's because the chemical potential of sodium chloride in the ice is equal to the chemical potential of sodium chloride in the liquid and likewise for the water molecules in the ice having the same chemical potential as the water molecules in the salty water. So there is no driving force at all for the salt to diffuse from the liquid into the ice and for them to become chemically homogeneous even though they have different chemical compositions. Now in the next lecture we will use these concepts to construct a variety of phase diagrams for alloy systems. That means not a pure substance, but containing a mixture of elements. Uh, so, see you soon.